today I'm going to go to Egypt. Egypt is a very peculiar country in many ways, and it's one of the early centers of Western civilization, one of the early cradles of Western civilization. Egyptian civilization begins about the same time as does Sumerian. Uh, but, of course, under entirely different circumstances. Now, Egypt is peculiar in many ways. This is one of them. The country is a thousand miles long from north to south. It's five miles wide. So, it's difficult for us to conceive of it, but nevertheless, that's the physical reality of Egypt. Now, if you look at a map, of course, it'll say Egypt, you know, 360,000 square miles in a big square corner. Uh, that's all Sahara Desert. The fact is that Egypt itself is along the banks of the Nile. It's the only place where people can live. And because it is of that size, five miles from cliff to cliff side to cliff side with the river in the center, and a thousand miles from north to south with a big meander, uh, and then the river as it flows out, uh, it spreads out into a delta. And the Greeks gave it the name delta because it has the shape of the letter delta as it flows out into what was uh, the sea at that point, but then the silt deposited and so the delta was built up. Now all of that gives them uh, about um, uh, an area of about 15, maximum 20,000 square miles, and which today they have a population of over 60 million. So uh, Egypt is crowded from north to south. The other thing is their orientation, is that the river flows from the south to the north, and it is enclosed by the two cliffs. The Nile has a, uh, an annual cycle. It rises and overflows its banks about uh, the beginning of summer, and as it recedes into the channel of the river, it leaves a coating of fresh fertile soil, new fertile soil, which is brought down in the silt that the river carries. And it, uh, it flows from uh, two sources. Uh, the White Nile uh, starts in Lake Victoria, which is on the equator, and it's a rather smaller stream. The Blue Nile flows out of the mountains of Ethiopia, and that is a tremendous uh, rush and as the result of these rains, which pour down on Ethiopia uh, in tremendous quantities as a result of the monsoon uh, floods, or the monsoon uh, winds which come across the Indian Ocean. In any event, it rains in Ethiopia, it flows down the Blue Nile, the White Nile from Lake Victoria, they join together at the point which is now the city of Khartoum, and Khartoum is the capital of Sudan, and then it flows down from there uh, to the mouth of the, uh, at the Mediterranean. A depositing soil as it floods. Egypt now has this, uh, you might say, a kind of regularity which is so predictable that it governs the life of the people and their mentality. Uh, the sun always shines. Uh, there is a um, a sunrise, you have the cliffs, so the sun comes down suddenly into the valley, and then when it sets, it gets dark suddenly because there are the cliffs on the west side. But there is this regularity of Egyptian life. The other thing about Egypt is that it's physically isolated because you can't go west, you're going into the desert, you can't go east, which is also desert. Going south, you get up to the point where the waterfalls are coming down, and the jungles of Africa begin, and that would be the southern limit of Egypt. And in the north, you have the Mediterranean. Now, the Mediterranean can be a source of uh, openness, of sailing out, of getting into touch with other peoples, and it was for a time uh, in the very early period of Egyptian history, and then later on, but for a long period of time, about a thousand years, Egypt just isolated itself from the rest of the world and became totally self-enclosed. Now, the interesting thing of that is that while it was enclosed, it was self-sufficient. I mean, they didn't 
really need much of the outside world, but also they didn't have any other influences. They were dealing with themselves alone, and they built up essentially elements of Egyptian civilization which are most remarkable.